Welcome to episode 72, the final episode in the series on the Kingdom Fungi. This has been a really wild ride, as the Fungi are an extremely cool, exotic, and ephemeral lineage. They are essential to the Earth's ecosystems, and yet they are like nothing else. Although many fungi are parasitic, many more are symbiotic with other organisms, and these fungal symbioses with plants and bacteria and insects and other animals are so powerful that they've had a profound influence on the evolution of earthly life. As humans evolved, we eventually descended from the shrinking East African forests and walked upright across the Horn of Africa, across the East African Rift Valley, and across the plains of the Sahel and the sandy expanses of the Maghreb. Humans spread into Asia and Europe, and then Australia, and across the islands of the Pacific Ocean and the Bering Land Bridge into the New World. As we spread out and colonized our planet, we explored it, and we learned from it, and we learned about the other forms of life that live here with us. And just as the animals could provide food and hide and bone, and plants could provide food and medicine and poisons, the fungi also found their purpose in human societies. This is the subject that I'll be exploring today, how humans have interacted with and used fungi throughout our history, from the ancient and prehistoric past into the modern day. Now, in a very general sense, humans use fungi in many of the same ways that we use plants. A huge diversity of fungi are cultivated or gathered wild for food, and those with medicinal qualities are used or consumed for their beneficial effects. In more modern times, our access to advanced technology has allowed us to study fungi on a chemical level, looking at their cells and their genes and their proteins. We can isolate fungal compounds and purify them to make chemicals that serve some practical purpose in the 21st century. I'll explore all of this and more in much greater detail in today's episode. In the earliest days of our existence, there was no recorded knowledge, and all that was known was transmitted orally, or through physical demonstration. There were no books, and no written languages. We were, in a very literal sense, naked and afraid, while wandering in the vastness of the world. To learn something required a touch of bravery. Imagine an ancient human living in the forest. They find a mushroom that they've never seen before. It's a new discovery. The shaman or the chieftain or some elders from the tribe will come to examine it, or they'll examine a sample brought back to them by the, uh, by the primitive mycologist. And they will all wonder at its qualities. Is it edible? Is it poisonous? Does it have some other effect or use? These questions had no answers. Of course, they would have tried to feed it to an animal first, or observed how a wild animal reacts to it. If an animal eats a mushroom and then dies, that's pretty good evidence of the danger of that type of mushroom. But if the animal doesn't die, it's much more ambiguous. The shaman and the elders wouldn't quite know exactly how the mushroom affects humans specifically until someone dared to eat it, and that takes a touch of bravery. Now, in the cases where an edible species was discovered, this would have been excellent news, as it was a new food resource, and it added variety to the diet. However, in cases where the new discovery wasn't edible, or where it was even dangerous, the daring person might become ill, perhaps terribly ill, to the point that they might even die. There are a number of poisonous fungi out there, some of which just cause mild problems. And there are some that are so poisonous, they are extremely fatal. For example, the fungal genus Claviceps has ergot fungi, like the species Claviceps purpurea, which infect and grow on rye plants. Animals, like humans, can accidentally ingest ergot while eating the rye or by eating bread or some other product made from the rye, and this can lead to ergot poisoning. This ailment is characterized by disruptions in neurotransmission, which can lead to hallucinations, convulsions and seizures, nausea and vomiting, 
and in large enough doses, it can be fatal. The Gallerina genus includes species of fungi that form small mushroom fruiting bodies with little rusty brown caps. The species Gallerina solsiceps is found in Indonesia and southern India, and it's particularly deadly. It produces alpha, beta, and gamma ammonitans, which are all deadly to humans in certain doses. Alpha ammonitan is the deadliest, as it's known to inhibit the activity of the RNA polymerase 2 and 3 enzymes. And these enzymes play a critical role in cell function. So when they're inhibited by uh, alpha ammonitan, their inhibition pretty much means cell death. And when that happens on a large enough scale, you know, with a large enough dose, the organism dies. Symptoms of alpha ammonitan poisoning last several days, and they start with diarrhea and abdominal cramps. The kidneys and the liver will experience a total collapse, and death will occur shortly thereafter, typically about six to seven days after exposure. The species Gallerina marginata is similarly poisonous, containing many of the same amatoxins. The Lepiota genus is composed of various species of gilled mushrooms, typically small and white with little scales on their caps and none of them are edible thanks to the presence of amatoxins. Species in this Lepiota genus, like L. castanea and L. subincarnata, have all been known to kill people. The Conocybe genus also has lethal amatoxin-containing species among its ranks, some of which include the Conocybe phalaris. Several more of these Conocybe species are poisonous, but not lethally so. They have enough toxin to alter your consciousness after ingestion, and they can induce psychoactive effects. But I'll get into these kinds of fungi later on. The amatoxins are also found in a species called the death cap, or the Amanita phalloides, which is an extremely lethal fungus. Its fruiting body is a pale white mushroom, with patches of pale greenish-tan hues on the cap and stem. Supposedly, a single mushroom possesses enough poison to kill two fully grown humans. And because of its widespread distribution, which extends across pretty much all of Europe into Russia, the Middle East, and North Africa, there have been thousands of societies that have had access to A. phalloides mushrooms and their poison. For these reasons, it's believed to be involved in the majority of intentional poisonings, including those of noble or royal blood. The Roman Emperor Claudius is believed to have been killed due wholly or in part to amatoxin poisoning from the Amanita phalloides. The historical figure Charles VI, who lived during the 17th and 18th centuries, was also an emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, whose symptoms immediately before his death are consistent with amatoxin poisoning. In the days before his death, Charles VI went on a hunting trip in Hungary, on a particularly cold, wet October day. After he returned to Vienna, he became sick, and rapidly died. Voltaire attributed this sudden sickness to a recent meal of death-cap mushrooms. It's possible that, while out hunting, the king's entourage was gathering foodstuffs from the local forest, and someone accidentally misidentified some Amanita phalloides death-cap mushrooms and picked them and put them in the food basket, thinking they were safe to eat. Or perhaps, someone made sure that those particular mushrooms were given to the king. The Amanita genus includes species responsible for most cases of fungal poisonings in humans. I mean, besides the Amanita phalloides, there's the Amanita virosa, Amanita exidialis, and the Amanita ocreata which are all white mushrooms in a group called the Destroying Angels. There are species like Amanita smithiana and Amanita pseudoporphyria, which can cause acute renal failure. But besides these handfuls of poisonous species, the Amanita genus also contains numerous mushrooms that are not just safely edible, but also nutritious and delicious. This includes the white and yellow gold Amanita calyptrata, and Caesar's mushroom, or the Amanita caesarea. Caesar's mushroom is eaten across Europe, where it's relatively popular. It's especially popular in Italy, where they even have a festival for it. Edible mushrooms are popular worldwide, and they exist in the diets of pretty much 
all people, including people who live archaic lifestyles and those who live ultra-modern lifestyles. The ancient Greeks enjoyed mushrooms in their diet, as did the ancient Romans and the ancient Chinese. Otzi the Iceman lived more than 3,000 years ago, and his body was found frozen in the Otztol Alps in 1991. This chalcolithic corpse carried on him clothes woven out of grass, a loincloth and a coat made from sheepskin, and a belt with a little pouch attached. In Otzi's little pouch, and elsewhere on his person, he had several items, like a copper axe, birch bark baskets, and berries for food. He also carried two types of mushrooms, a birch fungus and a tinder fungus. Now, the birch fungus is known to possess a chemical that wards off helminths, or parasitic worms. Keeping parasites away would have been a critically helpful thing in the ancient world, and this Otzi individual who lived 3,000 years ago, he carried some of this birch fungus as a kind of antibiotic analog. Not antibiotic, but anti-helminth. The other fungi, the tender fungus, or the Fomes fomentarius, has a similarly cool function. This fungus is inedible, so it provides no nutritional value, but it does have a tissue called an amidou, or an amidou. This tissue is spongy, and it can sustain a slow-burning, smoldering fire, and the amidou's tissue can be cut into strips to, to be used as tinder for a fire. In a way, it's kind of like a portable container of lighter fluid, except it's a little uh, mushroom, it's a little fungus cap. Furthermore, the amidou can be lit on fire while it's still inside the mushroom. And in these cases, the fire will burn slowly, it'll just smolder, and so the mushroom can be tucked away and carried. The fire will keep smoldering within it, and it can be brought out, opened up, and the embers used to start a new fire. So in this way, it's also like a Neolithic lighter, or a set of matches, for starting fires. It would be especially useful for anyone traveling over a long distance, who might not have all the tools at hand to make a fire from scratch. Okay, so I kind of got off topic a little bit, uh, so let me refocus back on fungus as food. Now, mushrooms, of all kinds, have been a staple in people's diet for millennia. Mushrooms are popular in Africa, in Europe, in the Americas, and especially in China. Generic mushroom foods include mushroom cream soups, which are just warm soups with mushrooms. There's mushroom gravies, sauces, and mushroom ketchups that are condiments that can be put on other entrees. Mushroom sauce on filet mignon can make a really good dinner, and it looks good on a plate, too. So this is the kind of mature, refined dish that you'd probably want to make for a date that you were trying to impress with your cooking skills. Mushrooms can also be sautéed in butter or oil, or they can be stuffed with vegetables, with meats like sausage, and with other kinds of fillings and flavorings. Perhaps most common and most well-known is the yeast used to make bread, or baker's yeast, which is mainly from a species called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The yeast used to make bread is the same species but a slightly different genetic strain than the yeast that's used to produce alcohol for beer and liquor and, you know, other alcoholic beverages. These fungal microbes metabolize the fermentable sugars in the dough, and they turn them into carbon dioxide and ethanol. The carbon dioxide forms bubbles, and you see these when you tear open a piece of bread and look at all of the little bubble structures that are in the bread. In Eastern Europe, like the Balkans all the way down to Turkey, they make a dish called siulama. This is a mixture of some kind of meat with mushrooms, slathered in a white sauce made from flour and grease-fried onions. Another Balkan mushroom dish is called a uh, selskomeso, which is a stir-fry mixture of pork, beef, tomatoes, onions, cream cheese, peppers, and mushrooms, in addition to spices, salts, and wine. These are typically all mixed together and cooked into a delicious medley. And in Haiti, there's a meal called diriak jonjon, which is a mixture of rice and black mushrooms called jonjon, which is served with meat. The mushrooms are boiled, which will stain the water a gray-black color, which will then soak into the rice, 
and this is what gives the dish its signature flavor. There's a French recipe for an item called duxelle? I'm not sure. But either way, it's a paste or a stuffing. So first, you have white or brown mushrooms, which are dried out and minced, or cut up into a bunch of tiny little pieces, and then you can use porcini mushrooms if you want a stronger kick to it, and all of these tiny mushroom pieces will get mixed together with onions or shallots and various herbs and peppers, and then sautéed in butter and mixed until it's a thick fluid, like a paste or a cream. It can be used as a sauce on another entree, or it can be used as a filling for a pastry. In a historical example, there was a French cook in the employ of a Russian prince who created a dish called veal orlov, which is thinly sliced veal filled with mushrooms and duxay sauce and onions between the slices. This is cooked into a pie shape, or a, a flat pizza-like shape, and covered with mome sauce. In Russia, this style of cooking and preparing veal is called French meat, or French-style meat. Now, the oyster mushroom is a large edible mushroom with a very thin cap, which makes it popular in the culinary arts. Because the mushroom cap is thin, it can be easily torn up into little strips for sautés and stir-fries. If the cap is cooked whole, or in pieces, its flat shape allows it to be cooked relatively quickly and evenly. The caps can be eaten by themselves, or they can be used in part of another dish, like an edible spoon filled with vegetables or a sauce, or a rice and meat mixture. The oyster mushrooms are popular in vegetarian cuisine, because they're a solid, nutritious, non-animal food that can be combined with numerous other foods to make a wide variety of dishes. Shiitake mushrooms are also a popular food, especially in Japan and elsewhere in East Asia. In the episode I did on humans and plants, uh, in my series on the Kingdom Planty, I talked about the dish that's popular in China called Buddha's Delight. And now, that was a really flexible dish, with a large number of ingredients that could be mixed and matched and replaced to meet your particular tastes. And a very common ingredient in Buddha's Delight, especially purely vegetarian forms of it, are mixed or sautéed mushrooms, like the shiitake. In Japan, shiitake mushrooms are a possible ingredient used to make miso soup. And miso soup is a soup made from miso paste, which is produced with fermenting soybeans, some salt, and the kojikin fungus, or the Aspergillus oryzae. There's another mushroom in East Asia called the anakotaki, or the winter fungus, also known as seafood mushrooms, or velvet foot, among several other names. Now this mushroom is used in salads, or it can be eaten by itself, and besides being pretty tasty and nutritious, they offer a few beneficial compounds like antioxidants, and a protein that's involved in immune system regulation. The Japanese also eat mushrooms that they call shimeji, which exist across East Asia and Northern Europe. The shimeji mushrooms are known for their strong, protein-rich flavor when cooked. And if eaten raw, it can be unpleasantly bitter. But the thing is, is that when they're cooked, the bitterness just melts away, and the mushroom becomes an excellent filler item which can be mixed in with other ingredients to add volume to a dish. The cooked shimeji mushroom is tasty and somewhat crunchy, and ideal for stir-fry and rice mixes. It can be eaten with meat, it's used in soups and sauces, and it's part of a stir-fry rice dish called takakomi gohan. In China, there's a popular mushroom called a snow fungus, or the silver ear fungus, or more scientifically as the tremella fusiformis, which produces gelatinous white fruiting bodies that are affectionately called white jelly mushrooms. Oddly, the mushroom has no real flavor, despite being used in a wide variety of dishes. The desired quality is its texture, which is soft and gelatinous. It's mixed with jujubes and other ingredients to make lukmei, which is a sweet-tasting dessert soup. It's used for the same purpose in other sweet-tasting foods, like ice creams, flavored drinks, and in Vietnamese desserts like pudding and soups. There's a genus of fungi called tubers, which include among its many member species a large number of delicious edible truffles. These truffles are fungi with hypogeous fruiting bodies. This is that the fruiting bodies grow underground, in the soil, which makes them kind of hard to find. Humans have used animals like pigs and dogs uh, to detect these truffles, 
which can then be dug up and gathered to be cooked and eaten. Some of these include the Oregon white truffle, the pecan truffle, which has recently been selling for more than $160 a pound, and the burgundy truffle, which is really popular in France and Italy. Now, I could go on with this, as there's quite a few edible mushrooms, and there's quite a few countries and cultures that consume mushrooms as a regular or staple part of their diet. But for the sake of brevity, and just in the interest of having something else to talk about, I'll move on from fungal foods to other constructive ways that humans have used fungi. Now, in all of the episodes of this series, I've talked about how good fungi are at exuding chemicals. They're, they're chemical-generating machines, and we can study these chemicals and find specialized uses for them. Many fungal chemicals and byproducts have a medicinal effect, and are used in both folk medicine and modern medicine. The folk medicinal use of fungus has a long history. For example, Chinese folk medicine has been using fungi like the Lingzi mushroom for over 2,000 years. In the Chinese historical record Book of Han, they're referred to as the mushroom of immortality. And in Vietnam, the Lingzi mushroom is called the soul mushroom, or the spirit mushroom, perhaps due in part to their role in folk medicine. You know, maybe people perceive them as being healing or life-saving or something. Although the thing is, is that the Lingzi mushroom hasn't been shown to have any significant effect on humans based on modern medical science. And this is a recurring problem with a lot of folk medicine around the world. If it works, or uh, if it has a compound that's useful, it'll get adopted into the sphere of legit medicine. But if it has no purpose beyond the placebo effect of whatever the seller says it does, it typically stays in the sphere of folk medicine, which has dubious effects at best. Again, if it actually has medicinal value, then it'll get adopted into the realm of legit medicine. Some of this folk medicine isn't even described as having a physical effect. It has some kind of uh, spiritual effect, or some kind of woo-woo effect. So take, for example, the Ophiocordyceps sinensis, or the caterpillar fungus which is described in Chinese folk medicine as being useful in restoring or balancing your yin and yang. Now, in real life, the fungus parasitizes caterpillars and moths from the genus Thetarodes, and this has been described as an ideal balance of yin and yang, as it has both animal and vegetable forms. Now, this is a case where folk wisdom is not particularly wise, because this isn't yin and yang. This is a parasite painfully hollowing out and infesting the living body of a host animal. And eating the fungus doesn't rebalance your chi. It actually just puts you at risk of arsenic poisoning. Although, I should definitely clarify that I don't mean to imply that all folk medicine is useless, or just archaic placebos. I mean, a lot of this stuff actually works, and it has chemicals that are legitimately medicinal. But the people using them may not have known how or why they worked, or how best to apply them or use them. Modern medicine and technologically modern science has revealed a huge diversity of fungal compounds that are potentially or uh, understood to be medicinal. Many of these compounds are synthesized in a lab, or through complex chains of biological reactions that involve enzymes isolated from different organisms. Many of these compounds are found directly in the fungus, and these were often the most readily available fungus-based medicines for people in the past. For example, there's a polypore mushroom called Griffola frondosa, which is native to Japan, China, and North America. In Japan, it's really popular, and it's been used medicinally for centuries. Consumption in humans has been shown to be of minor benefit to the immune system by acting as a kind of cell stimulator and it has a compound that can potentially be used to treat tumors by causing cancer cells to undergo apoptosis. Another fungus with immune-stimulating properties is the Agaricus subrufescens, which has a lot of beta-glucans that can stimulate the activity and the effectiveness of the immune system. Another fungus with anti-tumor properties is Ganoderma aplanatum, which is also called bear's bread because the fruiting body looks kind of like a big, thick pancake growing out of the side of a tree. In Japan, it's also named after its appearance, although they call it Kofuki Sarunu Koshikaki, 
which means dust or powder-covered monkey's bench. Yeah, you know, little monkeys swinging in the trees come and sit on them, I guess, is the idea. That's the imagery. Anyway, these aren't the only fungi that have anti-tumor or anti-cancer properties. There are quite a few more species that produce chemicals that can potentially treat cancer or cancer symptoms. But the organization Cancer Research UK says that no mushroom or mushroom extract has been shown to prevent or cure cancer. This doesn't mean that treatment is out of the question. If, for example, cancer of the bone marrow or leukemia can be treated with a medicine called asparaginase. This comes from the E. coli bacteria, but it can also come from the fungi in the genus Penicillium. Some of these fungi, like the Penicillium restrictii, are used in the process of synthesizing medications that disrupt cell division to slow down or stop the growth of tumors. P. restrictii is specifically used in the production of a chemotherapy drug called paclitaxel, or taxol. Now, I can't talk about the penicillium genus without mentioning penicillins. The penicillins are an extremely valuable and potent group of antibiotics, which were first discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928. The penicillins are bacteria-destroying chemicals produced by the fungus from the genus Penicillium. And there's various types of penicillin, but they all generally work by really thoroughly chemically degrading a bacteria's cell wall. Because bacteria have a really high internal pressure, this degradation of their cell wall will cause them to basically explode. The story of penicillin's discovery is famous. Alexander Fleming noticed that a petri dish with Staphylococcus bacteria was mistakenly left open, and there was now a teal-colored mold growing on it. Around the mold was an area of inhibited bacterial growth, which made Fleming think that the mold had some kind of antibiotic qualities. Working in relative obscurity due to his difficulty communicating and publicly speaking about his research, Fleming found that penicillin was non-toxic to humans, and that it could be stabilized with a treatment of heat and the proper pH. Penicillin was used to treat bacterial infections in mice, in infants, and adults, and it was used as a preventative measure to stop bacterial infections in the damaged tissue of burn victims. It was produced en masse for the troops during World War II, and after the war it became commonly used among the public. This wasn't a minor feat, either as mass-producing penicillin was, for quite some time, really challenging and expensive. In the modern day, penicillins have been used to create derivative medicines with a broader range of effect, as in they can affect a wider range of bacterial species with various chemical defenses. Some of these derived medicines include methicillin, flucloxacillin, curbenicillin, and ticarcillin. A few more diseases that can be treated with fungal-produced compounds include malaria and diabetes. Malaria is a particularly deadly infection caused by an amoeba pathogen. It can be treated with the fungal-produced compounds like zervomycins and cadiniopocin. Diabetes is a failure in the regulation of blood sugar, and it can be treated with fungal compounds like aspergillosol A and ternatin. Besides these, many fungi can and have been used by humans as agents for psychological and spiritual health. Some fungi species have psychotropic properties, producing chemicals that alter neurochemistry in weird ways. To the person ingesting the psychotropic fungi, the effects can be indescribably bizarre. These psychotropic fungi include the ink caps of the Copalandia genus, which grows in Mexico and in areas of North America, the golden-brown Inocybe genus, which has a reputation for being dangerous, the Balancia cyperi species, which contains ergot alkaloids and grows parasitically on grasses in Central and South America, and others, like the Peniolus genus in the Americas, Europe, and Africa, the Pluteus genus in Europe, and the many species of the Silocybe genus. Now, the Silocybe genus in particular is famous for its psychedelic biodiversity, which includes species like the P. azurescens, the P. cyanescens, the P. semilanciata, 
and most famous of all, the Psilocybe cubensis, also known as golden caps, or divine dung mushrooms. There's a broad range of mushrooms across multiple genuses that all contain psychedelic compounds like psilocin, psilocybin, biocystin, and other various alkaloids and tryptophans. It's just that the psilocybe genus is the most well-known and the most widely consumed. Now, many of these chemicals induce strong psychedelic and entheogenic effects. Through the first-person perspective, consuming these fungi can be a wild and profound experience, but despite the intensity, there is virtually no harm done by the drug itself to the brain or the body. These are human-safe, entheogenic compounds that put the magic in magic mushrooms. The archaeological evidence shows that human societies have been consuming psilocybin mushrooms for literally thousands of years, all over the world. They've been used widely in shamanic traditions, in ceremonies, and as part of an individual's spiritual development, in cultures from the inland expanses of Scandinavia to the Indian subcontinent, to the Australasian archipelago, and from the boreal stretches of North America down to the forests and mountainous highlands of South America. Their use was particularly popular in Mesoamerica, with many indigenous populations celebrating the hallucinogenic mushrooms as divine and sacred. The Aztecs called the local psilocybe mushroom that they used for this purpose the Teonanacatl, or the divine mushroom. The Mesoamerican peoples used these mushrooms ritualistically, for their spiritual and religious significance, until the Spanish came and invaded. The Christian Spaniards perceived the mushroom consumption and the associated rituals to be a form of idolatry and a violation against Christ, and so they suppressed it. They weren't entirely successful, as remote communities maintained their traditions, but a lot of blood was shed over this. The high praise for these fungi comes from their numerous beneficial effects, which, depending on the dosage, can be profound and life-altering. They also have no physical negatives. They don't cause dependence. They aren't habit-forming. And even though it's technically a poison, no one has ever died from it as far as I know. You would need to eat a lot of it to fatally overdose. And really, the worst negative that comes from them is when you have what's called a bad trip. Now, if you've never consumed psilocybin mushrooms, but you're interested in trying them and experiencing the mycelial wisdom that so many other humans have experienced going back for thousands of years, then pay attention, because I'm going to tell you what to do. Typically, you might want to start with a small dose, unless you're feeling brave or you've had experiences with other psychedelics. Now, less than one gram of the dried mushroom is a small dose that will have minor effects, if you feel anything at all. Regular doses are between one and two and a half grams and stronger doses are up to 5 grams. Anything more than that is popularly described as a heroic dose, thanks to psychedelic popularizers like Terence McKenna. If you've never heard of Terence McKenna, when you have some time off, go on YouTube and look up some Terence McKenna lectures. That guy will open up your mind in really strange ways that you never considered before. Anyways, after you've consumed your mushrooms, you'll have to wait a bit for them to kick in which can take about 45 minutes to 2 hours. Now during this time, you might feel uncomfortably excited or anxious, but try to remain calm, as this anxiety is just a temporary and superficial response. The experience of psilocybin intoxication is very subjective, as it depends on your set and setting and the things that you've been through recently in your life and things that you're thinking of in your emotional state. Now, your set and setting is really important. Your set refers to your mindset. It's your psychological state going into the psychedelic experience. You want to be in a good mood, with nothing pressing on your mind, with no other work that you should be doing, no approaching deadlines, nothing that might make you worry excessively or get anxious about. The setting refers to your literal physical setting, where you are, who you're with, what you're doing. You want your setting to be somewhere calm and peaceful, where you can have privacy and feel safe. If you have people with you, you generally want them to be friends or people you like or trust. It's nice to have a trip sitter, 
which is a sober person who will watch over you and get you water or blankets or anything you might want. And it's also nice to have someone to consume the mushrooms with, who will have an experience with you. In traditional shamanic rituals, the shaman will ingest the substance with you, and they will guide you through the experience and help you learn from it. This experience, or this trip, will last about four to eight hours, depending on the dosage, although the strongest effects occur in the first couple hours. Well, after the peak, the effects will wear off slowly, and they're, they become relatively easy to ignore. Now, at the beginning, as the effects set in, you might notice that colors are brighter and more vivid, and that lighting is much more rich and vibrant. You might notice visual hallucinations when you look at patterned surfaces, like carpet or stucco walls. These surfaces and patterns can seem to liquefy and melt together or they might seem to breathe, or warp and twist. If stuff is moving around you, especially lights, you might see trails following the objects. If you listen to music, you might be struck by a profound emotional impact, and the quality of the musical piece may seem to be the best or the coolest thing you've ever heard. The trip is also extremely introspective. If you follow your trail of thoughts, you can stumble upon insights about yourself that are profound and life-altering. You might find confidence, or courage, or conviction where you need it. You might find compassion, and empathy, and sensitivity for your fellow creatures. You can very deeply realize a connection between yourself and the rest of the living world, in experiences that are described as deeply humbling and spiritual. At higher doses, the overwhelming power of the psychedelic will lead to a trip climax known as ego death. Now that sounds pretty scary, but it's actually described as being the most serene and peaceful feeling in the world. Upon ego death, your individual sense of yourself, of who you are, breaks down. The sense of you as you breaks down, and your sense of self expands to include all things. It is the sense that you are a seamless part of the universe. You're not just a thing inside the universe reacting to it and trying to engage with it. You are an integral and perfect part of the greater whole. It is a divine sense. Some describe seeing their God, or the wheel of infinite reincarnation, or they feel the loving eyes of 3.9 billion years of ancestors looking down at them. But most commonly, People feel a sense of infinity and immortality, that we exist simply as part of the greater universe, and as the greater universe will go on forever, we are a part of that, so we will go on forever, in a, uh, in a rather more explicit and literal sense than you might think. These fungi can produce entheogenic experiences, or the experience of coming into contact with the divine. Many people who have had a strong experience with psilocybin will describe it years later as the most spiritual moment of their lives. Of course, all of this comes with having a certain respect for the psilocybin mushroom and using its intoxication constructively. Plenty of people consume them just for fun, with no intention of meditation or introspective thinking. Now that's fine too, as long as they're being responsible and not endangering themselves or other people. In the modern day, there's a lot of legal problems surrounding the psilocybin mushrooms. Despite their relatively safe and beneficial effects, they're described as a Schedule I drug by the UN 1971 Convention on Psychotropic Substances. And in the US and other Western countries like the UK and Canada, possession of psilocybin and psilocybin mushrooms carries extremely heavy legal and financial punishment. I'll be the first to say that these prohibitions on psilocybin are not just anti-scientific and stupid, they're outrageous and offensive to any sense of human freedom and dignity. I absolutely can't stand these moralizing laws that pretend to control how you can alter your own mind, as if the government or any other person at all has that right. People get thrown in prison for this, and it's sickening. It's terrible because using these substances to explore your own mind and to have really remarkable, spiritually beautiful revelations about yourself, your life, the people around you, the world you live in, that people and cultures across the world have been doing for thousands of years. 
If any experience defines the human birthright, it's the psychedelic experience. It's really unfortunate that here in the modern world, these substances and these mushrooms are really prohibited. But the silver lining is that there is progress being made. Thanks to organizations like MAPS, or the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, psilocybin-containing mushrooms are undergoing Phase 1 and Phase 2 studies for efficacy in human patients, specifically for use in treating PTSD in combat veterans. They also study psilocybin's use in treating end-of-life anxiety and the fear of death in patients with terminal illnesses, and all of their studies have shown really remarkable beneficial results. Even the FDA is interested. Rick Doblin, the founder of MAPS, has reported that the FDA is shocked at how effective psilocybin is, considering its dosage and the almost complete lack of negative side effects. The FDA has described psilocybin as a breakthrough drug that can treat treatment-resistant depression and PTSD. And thanks to what has been described as a political turnover in the FDA, there's a lot more internal political will to look at psychedelics and other drugs that have traditionally been prohibited, that have, that have been on these schedule lists, and, uh, and look at them in a more inquisitorial and scientific light so we can see if there's any medicinal value there. Because if we just kept these, these substances prohibited forever and no one got to use them, that would be a terrible thing. Because these are powerful substances that can go a long way in healing some of our worst psychological trauma. All right. Well, I've talked about fungus for long enough. This is the end of a long episode, and it's the end of a long but amazingly fascinating series on the Kingdom Fungi. As I've explored this mycelial world with you, I hope you were able to learn stuff and get inspired about how crazy and wild and exotically alien the fungi really are. These are amazing organisms, often unseen and overlooked, but they are absolutely integral to our biosphere. Just as fungus is a big part of human societies, fungus is a big part of planet Earth. Fundamentally, the fungi are the world's biological recyclers, taking biomass locked up in the rotting corpses of dead animals and rotting plants and dissolving them on a chemical level, so as to return nutrients back into the ecosystem to support the birth and the growth of new life. And as always, thanks for listening.